Welcome to lesson number six. We're going to take a look at energy in the atmosphere for the first chapter of weather factors. Um, we completed a lab that was dealing with energy in the atmosphere and we also um, are going to take a look at some of the notes that were in that section so that way we can try to tie both of those in together. And um, to start with I have a picture that was taken from our lab and uh, you can see that the students had designed it in a way where this light was shining onto a beaker that was filled with water. So there was water on the inside here and this one had sand and um, basically they had their thermometers at the very tip of the water and of the sand. And the idea was we wanted to see which one was going to heat up faster and which one was going to cool off faster. And um, we had textbooks that were stacked up to give us some height and we also had this uh, bar going across the top where the students tied their thermometers on to, um, to be able to simulate this activity. So let's take a look at the lab a little bit more in depth. Um, again, the idea was to have the students take these different beakers and to um, fill them up with the sand and the water like we had just seen and they had the bar that was going across with the thermometer going right into the very top of it and heating it up for anywhere between 1 to 15 minutes so it could have potentially been 10 minutes as well because that was one of the time frames and we had sand and we also had water on the other side and so each one got an increment of temperature and so we were able to see um, with heating which one was able to heat up first and then afterwards we took off so if we go back and look at this um, we turned this light off then after a certain amount of time the 10 to 15 minutes and we were able to then um, record basically 16 to 30 minutes um, again recording the different temperatures to see which one cooled off the fastest and so um, that's kind of the overview of how we set it up and ran it and you were able to produce lots of data once you were done with the lab um, you were asked to answer a few of the questions um, these are some of the questions that uh, were asked on there it said write an explanation for task challenge number five and um, the basically what task number five was was uh, making a statement about your um, results and a lot of you probably would have had a discovery that um, the sand heated up the fastest and cooled the fastest. Okay, so that would have been if um, if you ran the lab absolutely correct, you would have seen the sand that would have heated up first. And um, that makes sense because if you've ever had the opportunity to walk um, on a beach in the summertime and if you're walking around on there barefoot you're gonna notice that the sand is really really hot and um, a lot of times it, it actually hurts your feet when you're doing it and at nighttime if you come back to that same spot after the sun had gone down um, the sand actually feels cold on your feet and so um, there's two contrasting uh, variations of how the sand actually um, it reacts with the sun shining on it and without the sun being present. And you probably have felt the same thing if you've gone in the water on a very hot day. The water feels cold and if you, uh, if you come back at nighttime, um, the temperature of the water actually feels warmer. And the main reason why is that the water doesn't necessarily heat up as fast. Um, and it also doesn't cool off as fast and so um, it takes quite a while for water to get heated up and for it to cool off. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through some of these questions. Um, question number two of the lab was basically asking us to uh, calculate the total change uh, in temperature from each material. So if we were going to uh, do this we would have to account for where um, our sand was. So sand sand and you had to take the uh, highest temperature that it got to so whatever the maximum temperature was and 
subtract it from the original starting temperature. And that in itself would give you the, um, if you did it in Fahrenheit or you might have done it in Celsius, um, it would have given you the total change. So what was it at its maximum temperature to uh, what was it at its starting point? Um, and you would have done the same thing for water. Again, a maximum temperature along with uh, subtraction of the starting temperature. And that would have given you um, your answer. And you had to do this for both the heating and the cooling. Again, trying to figure out what the difference is or the total change um, was for the actual material. And again, if you did this correctly, you would have seen that uh, the largest temperature change would have come in the form of the sand. Question three said, based on your data, which material had the greater increase in temperature? Um, the greatest increase probably would have been the sand. And again, the reason for that is it is a solid. And solids absorb energy better. And the main reason why is that if it's, uh, if it's a solid, the particles are closer together. So imagine that a solid has the particles grouped together. And they actually are going to already be vibrating. But when the sun strikes them, they actually vibrate faster. And so it's going to hold in more energy versus a liquid where they're a little bit more spaced out, which means that um, there is room for these particles to collide uh, a little less frequently. And so, uh, so looking at that question, the sand would have been the one that is going to absorb energy better. All right, looking at uh, the next question, it says, based on your results, um, which do you think will heat up more quickly on a sunny day, the water in a lake or the sand surrounding it? Um, I kind of answered that question already, and hopefully you have enough experience from it to know that it would be the sand is going to heat up more on a sunny day. And then after dark, which is going to cool off again, um, it would be the sand is going to cool off on a sunny day. Which is good, because if um, every day that the sun was shining and it was summertime, our lakes and oceans would become extremely warm, and obviously the organisms that are living in there would not be able to survive. So um, overall, that was kind of the, uh, the lab. And so let's take a little look at the notes uh, from this section. Um, to start with, uh, the question that we often start with is, where does the heat come from? And heat comes from uh, something that is called electromagnetic waves. And electromagnetic waves are a form of energy that can move through a vacuum of space. And when we refer to the word vacuum, we're not talking about the type of vacuum you'd use to uh, get your floor clean. What we're actually talking about is a vacuum like outer space. And so the sun is obviously able to travel through um, outer space, through the atmosphere, and get to our Earth. And so the vacuum of space they're referring to is actually um, that space, that their outer space um, is kind of where it's traveling through. And all waves, um, especially electromagnetic waves, are going to be classified based on wavelengths. And a wavelength is basically the space from crest to crest. So from top of the wave to the other top of the wave, that space in between it is called a wavelength. And there are shorter wavelengths and there are longer wavelengths, and we're going to talk a little bit about each one of those. Um, also, another part of electromagnetic waves is the idea of radiation. And radiation is the direct transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. OK? 
Okay, so um, it's the direct transfer of energy um, by electromagnetic waves. And you feel radiation all the time. Um, in the summertime, if you uh, step outside and you can feel the sun coming down on you and you're like, boy, it's warm out and I can feel the heat on my face, um, that's a form of radiation. It is actually radiation. It's the electromagnetic waves that are directly transferring um, to you. And you can feel these all the time. If you uh, pick up a pan that has been heated up, um, you can feel that there's a transfer of energy from the stove to the pan to your hand and so um, that's that's another example of radiation uh, the one that you guys are more familiar with is visible light and um, most of the energy is that we are able to see is in the form of visible light so it's light that uh, we can see And uh, we watched the video in class that was dealing with Roy G. Biv. Of course, that's the color spectrum dealing with red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And um, we call this the, the color spectrum or the visible light spectrum. So visible light spectrum. And um, these are all the colors that we see. And we played the fun game that was guess the color of my shirt. And obviously we learned that it's the absorption of all the colors um, with the exception of the, uh, the one color that isn't present that actually gives the color away. So um, that's dealing with visible light. And uh, infrared radiation, on the other hand, has, um, they have much longer waves and um, these ones are longer than red waves. So if you're thinking of Roy G. Biv, um, they're going to be found over here. So infrared is going to be found on here. And they have longer waves, which means that they are going to have larger space in between here. Um, and of course, these are not visible. They aren't visible uh, types of waves. And there's also ultraviolet radiation, which is um, shorter waves. And um, these are the ones that are found, again, if you have our visible spectrum, Roy G. Biv. We said that we had the longer wavelengths with infrared. And over here we had UV. Um, these ones have much shorter wavelengths in between them. So if these are kind of just standard waves, these ones are longer waves, these ones are shorter waves. Um, and, and all that means is that they travel at different speeds. Obviously, if there's less space in them, they're going to be moving much faster um, and they're going to be able to travel um, much more quickly. And these are the ones that we have to be careful of. Um, these are the ones that we feel. We feel the infrared. That's what makes it feel warm on our faces. These are the ones that we're able to see. The UV radiation ones are the ones that actually give you your burn in the summer. Um, and obviously, uh, too much of that can be, can be a problem for um, your health. And so you have to be a little bit careful of that. And we talked about that briefly in class. Now, to try to tie all of this together, all right, now that you have some background information on it, um, we need to think about what we were trying to accomplish today um, in the lab. And so our lab was basically taking and using sand. So let's make this our sand beach. So from here down, um, let's change the color of it, and let's make this uh, a brown color, all right? So this is all of our our sand all of that stuff in there and let's go back and add in some water so here is our we'll call it our lake which is obviously filled with water and um, let's put in our sunlight So our sunlight will be right here. Give it a little smiley face. And um, a lot of the light is going to come down and it's going to strike these different areas. 
And as it's traveling down, it's moving in the form of electromagnetic waves. So electromagnetic waves are the different forms, remember, um, that we feel. All right. So if this is a person that's standing on the beach, very happy, maybe they're on summer break, and they feel the warmth of the sun, we would say that that is infrared radiation, the feeling of the warm sun. And actually, that light that is striking the sand that is causing the person to feel the warmth is that radiation. And um, it also is happening over here in the lake. The difference is, is again, because of the fact that the particles have more space in them, um, it's not going to heat up nearly as fast, and it's also not going to cool down as fast. So a lot of our energy in our app that from the sun comes, and it heats up Earth's surface. Now, we also need to account for the fact that there is a couple of different layers that are above us. Um, those layers that we talk about are the atmosphere. And we know that there are different layers. We talked about it in our last chapter. There's the troposphere, the uh, uh, ozone layer, the, uh, which is the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. Those are all the different layers. And what happens is that sometimes the sun is actually able to um, hit our ozone layer and it actually repels a lot of it back. So some of the sun's rays strike the atmosphere and get repelled back into space. Some of them are able to pass through and that's what heats our Earth's surface. And some of them, when they strike the sand or the water or any surface, are going to reflect back. And once they reflect back, they are trapped inside of our atmosphere. And we actually call that process the greenhouse effect. So if we're talking about um, greenhouse effect is the idea that it's trapping heat in the troposphere. Okay, so what's actually happening is that a lot of the rays, while they absorb and they get warm, a lot of them also reflect back and they get sent back to our atmosphere where they trap it in. And our greenhouse effect is important because it's what allows for Earth to be able to live on. Um, if it was, if there was no, uh, if there was no atmosphere, what would happen is that a lot of these. Um, waves would end up getting sent back into outer space and it would cool down very fast. Um, and so it is a problem the more and more damage that we do to our ozone layer. Um, it's actually taking, it's like taking a blanket off of your bed. Obviously it's going to get cooler and it's not going to be as warm. And so um, our greenhouse effect is important because of the fact that it helps to heat up and keep our temperatures on Earth at a comfortable level. Now if there's too much carbon um, that's entering in. So imagine having almost an extra blanket. So imagine there's another layer um, of carbon that's down below. What actually happens then is it can get too warm um, when the sun's rays strike and reflects back up. It can actually heat up the earth too warm, which actually results in um, melting of glaciers. Uh, uh, it can actually cause um, water temperatures of lakes and oceans to warm up and, and we're actually seeing some of these results and so there's a big push to try to limit the amount of carbon that's being uh, put into our atmosphere. And so um, the sand, you can see, gets heated up through infrared radiation and the water also does, but sand heats up faster than water does. And that's important as we had talked about. Now. Um, one of the things uh, to finish off and um, kind of put the finishing touches on this, uh, we'll go back here to um, one of our previous slides so that way I can uh, do a little bit more of the drawing. Um, let's go to this one right here. I'll go down here and write. So one of the things that was asked in your spark activity was what is the reason for that picture that had basically um, different colors in the sunset? 
So how do we end up with a blue sky? How do we end up with in the morning or at nighttime having different colors? And so let's talk a little bit about that. The first thing we need to talk about is the position of the sun. Okay, as we know, the sun comes up on the horizon and at times it's going, well, over the course of the day, it's going to travel and eventually it's going to set back down in the horizon. And it's actually the earth turning which is causing the fact that the sun is on the horizon and then out of the horizon again. But what happens is that there are all these different types of particles. There's dust particles, there's different elements that are found up in the um, in our atmosphere. So if we add all of these different uh, colors that are going to be up here, and it's not really a matter of colors, it's actually the angles of the sunlight that we're hitting and the angle that we're at. So if I draw a person again, so here is a person that is standing and they are looking um, very early in the morning. The sun is on the horizon, so it's not at its highest point, so that means that the waves have to travel a long distance to strike. And because of the fact that it has to uh, travel long distance, and if you can remember from this slide, um, back over here, we said that infrared, when it has longer wavelengths, is going to be closer to red. And if you remember our color scheme, which is Roy G. Biv, right, so if we apply Roy G. Biv, and we know that the sun is having to send these electromagnetic waves a long distance, um, the wavelengths are going to be much longer which means the fact that you're going to start to see some of these reds and oranges and yellows and um, that's why we start to see that in the morning as the sun is starting to come up in the horizon it's hitting the the particles that are up in the sky at different angles and so it comes back to us in these red orange and yellow colors and as the sun continues to get um, get higher and higher into the sky or as, as it turns further and further we start to see that our sky begins to become blue which means that now the wavelengths are getting shorter and shorter and so the distance becomes shorter and shorter here it had to go all the way up and back down now when it's here it just has to hit and send it back to you so we start to see the blue color um, in in the afternoon time and then as the sun begins to set at nighttime again um, it's on the horizon which means that it's going to have a long distance that it needs to travel to get back to you so we're going to start to see the red the orange and the yellow again and so they actually call this process scattering it's a definition that you need to know so scattering by definition is dust particles when sun light hits at different angles. So it's basically dust particles that are being hit by different um, angles of sunlight which gives us our color of our sky. And so you can kind of tie this back in together with the activity that we did. I wanted you to be aware of infrared radiation, which is basically the heating up of Earth's surface and the fact that it's kind of, uh, that solids are going to heat up faster. And it's going to be important to understand that solids heat up faster than liquids because um, all of our weather is based on this concept. All right, we'll talk to you later. Thanks.